Evolutionists proudly tout Lucy as a missing link between apes. What they don't realize is that their proud discovery is really just another fraud. They claim Lucy's knee joint is proof positive that she walked upright, but they don't tell you it came from kilometers and several strata away from where the rest of her body was found. They tell you her hips flared out like a human's, but don't tell you that her hips were broken and reconstructed to appear that way. Initially, they were just like a chimps. They display her with human hands and feet, but don't tell you that her hands and feet were never found. In the end, Lucy was just an ape. Creationists could have told them this if they'd only asked. This is the most complete fossil ever found, and this is the best they've got. I had to investigate. The first Australopithecus ever discovered was the Tong child, discovered by Raymond Dart in 1925 in Tong, South Africa. The juvenile skull had a brain no larger than a chimp's, but the facial features were flatter, the teeth were smaller, and most notably, the spinal column projected downward from the skull like a human being's, indicating upright walking. The specimen was dubbed Australopithecus africanus. As I discussed in episode 8, when the Piltdown Man fraud was being perpetrated, the speculation was that human ancestors gained a bigger brain before for losing their larger teeth and other defenses. The Tong child was among the first discoveries showing that this speculation may be wrong, but more interestingly, that Piltdown Man just didn't fit in the human family tree. In April of 1947, after a decade of excavating a site at Sturkfontein, South Africa, Robert Broom and John T. Robinson discovered another well-preserved Australopithecine skull. This one, cataloged as STS-5, became known as Mrs. Plez. In August of the same year, at the very same site, the team uncovered covered STS-14, a fairly complete Australopithecine spinal column, hips, and rib bone of possibly the same individual. This find made upright bipedality conclusive as the spine lined up into an S pattern like a human instead of an arc like a chimp, and even more so, the orientation of the hips was nearly identical to modern humans. Over the next decades, other fossils were discovered that filled in more features about Australopithecus. Scientists were aware that they were able to recognize distinct species. In November of 1973, Donald Johansson and a team of others discovered the joint portion of a tibia in Hadar, Ethiopia. He initially thought it to be some sort of monkey, and while writing it up, noticed a femur as well. Putting the two together, they lined up perfectly into a knee joint. But there was another detail. The inner condyle of the femur was longer than the outer condyle. This disparity in size is only seen in humans, which indicates that the owner of the joint walked upright in a bipedal manner. The find was cataloged as AL-129-1. The following year, Johansson decided to return to the site. By October, the team had found an upper palate and teeth from another individual. This in itself was encouraging, but the real find was yet to come. On November 30th, 1974, Johansson noticed an arm bone protruding from the wall of a gully. After investigating further, he also found the back of a small skull, a femur, vertebrae, part of a pelvis, ribs, and pieces of jaw. The find was cataloged as AL-288-1. That evening, the team celebrated and, noting that the pelvic girdle was indisputably female, named the find Lucy, after the Beatles song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which had repeatedly been playing that day. The team prepared the area for further excavation and, after three weeks, had found several hundred fossilized bones with no duplication whatsoever, indicating that they were all from the same individual. In the end, they had found a 40% complete skeleton of an individual with facial features similar to the Tong child, but with significant portions of the lower anatomy as well. No knee joint was ever found for Lucy, but both her left femur and her right tibia were. Applying bilateral symmetry, it became obvious that her knees were similar to AL-129-1, meaning she very likely was bipedal. Knowing that the strata in which Lucy and the knee were found were older than the strata associated with the Tong child, they, along along with Mary Leakey's finds, were dubbed Australopithecus afarensis in honor of the Afar region of Ethiopia. Oddly, however, the type specimen designation went to Leakey's LH4, which was found in Tanzania. During reconstruction, a problem arose. By using bilateral symmetry to complete the hip, 
it became obvious that the pubic bones did not line up correctly. In this orientation, it has been compared to a chimp, but there was a small detail. It was found in a condition that couldn't possibly exist in real life. Owen Lovejoy, with the task of reconstructing the hip, decided to make casts of the hip bones. What he noticed was that part of the ilium had been crushed and bent backwards. This becomes obvious when comparing the hip to a normal hip. Lovejoy separated the broken portions and restored them to their original shape. When bilateral symmetry is a Applied to the restored hip, the pubic bones line up and we can see that Lucy walked upright. This reconstruction also happens to match STS-14. Being fairly certain that Lucy was bipedal, the question arose, what did Lucy's feet and hands look like? At the time, no specimens existed of an Australopithecine foot, so there was no model to work from, but the hands would be available very soon. The next year, Johansson joined another excavation in Hadar, Ethiopia, and discovered the remains of at least six individual Australopithecines. In the decades since, the site has yielded at least 17 individuals overall. The collection became known as the First Family. Amongst this cache of bones and teeth were several hand bones from several individuals. Compositing them, we can see that the shape of the afarensis hand is fairly human. Unfortunately, the well seemed dry on Australopithecine feet, so determining their shape would take more time. The only helpful information at the time came from Mary Leakey's discovery of the Laetoli footprints. They certainly appeared to be from a diminutive hominid species, and they were from the same time period, so public reconstructions used them as a rough model. In 1994, Ronald J. Clark was searching through boxes of fossils collected from the cave system in Sterkfontein, South Africa. He found four foot bones and then continued searching. Over the course of four years, Clark and his team had uncovered the most complete Australopithecus skeleton ever found, STW-573. Dubbed Littlefoot, this specimen included a nearly complete foot. This foot, however, set off some debates. Due to the angle of the big toe and a few other features, the question arose, was she solely bipedal or was she bipedal and arboreal? The question may have been answered in February of 2011 when Carol Ward found a fourth toe bone from the ongoing First Family excavation site in Hadar, Ethiopia. Cataloged as AL333-160, the single foot bone reveals that Lucy species had an arch to their feet. This indicates a life committed to walking bipedally. Lucy wasn't the first Australopithecus to be discovered. She isn't the most complete Australopithecus to be discovered. And since recent discoveries have shown that she shared the world with several other species of upright walking apes, her species may not have even been our direct ancestors. She is nonetheless significant as the confirmation of the many predictions that the theory of common descent has made decades ahead of time about the features that our ancestors must have developed on their way toward becoming human. The whole creationist argument comes down to ignoring this evidence. The proposition that Lucy's knee came from a separate location only comes from someone like Tom Willis, who cited Johansson when he was asked in a 1986 lecture how far away from Lucy did you find the knee? His response, 60 to 70 meters lower in the strata and 2 to 3 kilometers away, was in reference to AL-129-1, which was never posited to be part of Lucy's skeleton. Willis could have looked at any picture of Lucy and seen for himself that she never had a knee joint and was never associated with one. If he had wanted to actually test the claim that Lucy's knee was similar to AL-129-1, he could have looked at her femur and seen the longer condyle. The proposition that Lucy's hips were broken and fused specifically to appear human can only come from someone like David Menton, who based his claim on a poorly edited PBS special. He could have easily read Owen's paper describing exactly what he did and why. He could also have easily viewed STS-14 and noticed that it perfectly matched Lucy's reconstruction. The proposition that Lucy's hands and feet were pure fantasy can only come from skeptics who would rather believe they are right than actually look at the treasure trove of Australopithecine finds showing that the skull, spine, hips, knees, and feet all indicate an upward posture, not to mention the sheer number of hand bones found at the first family site. Skepticism is perhaps the hallmark of science. If you expect your proposition to be accepted by others, you must be able to answer the skeptics. Skeptics, on the other hand, have their own duty of examining the evidence that is presented to them. And that's another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.